Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 15 and let's look at what Paul is teaching of first importance. We saw this two weeks ago. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That horrific death that he went through prophesied in Psalm 22. And that he was buried according to the scriptures. And that on the third day he what? He rose according to the scriptures. Now this is something Jesus was telling his disciples. Paul tells this tells the church at Corinth, and he doesn't just tell the church at Corinth this, by the way. In Acts, in chapter 13, if you start around verse 26 to, to the end of the chapter 41, the end of Acts 13, the whole thing, Paul has given a message on his, on his first missionary journey up there in Poseidon, Antioch. He, he goes on his journey with Barnabas to Crete and up over to the Poseidon. He, when he gets there, he says, guys, the men of Jerusalem... Um, they actually rejected the one God sent to them as the Messiah. And they beat him according to the scriptures. And they, and they um, killed him and they buried him. And on the third day, Paul says, he rose again. That's funny how the same components are taught in multiple places. Do you think we should key in on this? If the Bible tells the same three things in multiple places, do you think it's a clue? It's just for my gray mind, you know, a little dense matter. He goes, I'm going to repeat this a few times. You know, any good teacher, unfortunately, teachers have to repeat themselves sometimes because sometimes we're distracted. There's people doing stuff in the background, and you have to get everybody back on the same page. And it's just part of being a good teacher. You don't, you just, you give up on, right? You just, man, I'm going to sound stupid. I had to repeat this five times today. But I lost half the people every time I said it. This is how it goes, teaching on a beach in Hawaii. But I don't mind because God's word repeats this over and over, that Christ would be buried. Now, where does it say he would rise on the third day? Where is the Old Testament scripture? How, how could I even come up with something to explain that he'd be dead and buried for three days or swallowed by death? Jesus said it, that's right. There you go. Matthew chapter 12. She said, the only sign what will be given to you will be the sign of Jonah. Let's turn to Matthew 12 and look at that very passage. Because the, the Pharisees and, and, the, and the scribes had gone to Jesus in verse 38 of Matthew 12. And they said, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And Jesus answered them, verse 39, he said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. He said, but no sign shall be given to you except the sign of Jonah the prophet. He says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men, he said, of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Here's Jesus explaining the Old Testament shadow or type. Now he's Jewish, so he knows the Jewish culture. He knows they like those shadows and types of, you know, explanations of, of the things about the Messiah. There was all these, all these cool shadows of the, of the foretelling of the coming of the Messiah. And he said, just, the, you want to sign, the only sign you get is Jonah. Now Jonah was the preacher, it says, supposedly the preacher of righteousness. But God said, go to Nineveh and Tell them to repent. Now, turn with me to the book of Jonah. Some of you, it, you're going to have to go from Matthew just back a few pages into your Old Testament. It's right, I don't know, it's really close. In, it's, in the, it's in the grouping of the last ten small little books of the Old Testament. Since we're in Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, just a few pages back, you ought to run into Jonah. You got Amos, Ob <coughs> Amos Obadiah, Jonah. Micah, Nahum, just look in there in that section, you'll find Jonah. And go to chapter 1. 
And look at verse 17. If, you, if you're a note taker, this, I'm doing this for Cindy, who's not with us right now. She's on the mainland with her, helping her uh, in-laws as they're moving back. But, but she's my great note taker. She's going to want to know. Jonah 1.17. It says, The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And it, if you go to the next chapter, it's a prayer of Jonah as he cries out from his distress to the Lord. He says, Lord, I, I call out in my distress, verse 2. He says, and, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depths of Sheol, and you heard my voice. For you have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me, and all your breakers and billows passed over me. And I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water has encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Now, what weeds was wrapped? I mean, this guy's bobbing in the ocean. Remember, they threw him overboard because he was, there was a great storm assailing the guys on the ship that he was on. He was actually sailing the wrong direction. He was supposed to go to Nineveh, God said. He, he got on a ship going the opposite direction. And the Lord went, you're going the wrong way. So it made a huge storm come to them. You can read Jonah 1 for extra credit tonight. And the sailors, they drew lots and said, whose fault is it that this great storm has assailed us? And the lot came to Jonah and they said, tell us, what have you done? Aren't you one of those God-fearing men? He's like, yeah, but I'm not doing what God wants me to do. I'm supposed to go the other way. Well, what did you get on our boat for? He goes, all right, just throw me overboard and God will make you not perish from the storm, right? They chuck him overboard. He's saying, God, I've descended and, and, and weeds have wrapped their, around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars are around me forever. He's describing a pretty dark, deep place, isn't he? But you brought me out from, the, from my life, from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving that which I vowed I will pay. Salvation, he said, is from the Lord. And then, this is his prayer. Going, Where is he praying this prayer, do you think? Any guesses? Inside the belly of the fish, right? And now I laugh because some... You know, if you read old commentaries from, from 18, 1700s of our, you know, writings from bygone eras, they said, there's no fish big enough to swallow a man and keep him alive. And like, too bad they didn't have National Geographic Explorer. Because you guys have seen how big some of those, those whale sharks and, and, and just, I mean, we got some big critters in the ocean. And we, we haven't even... They say we haven't even discovered everything that's down really deep. What if the Lord sent one of them big, deep creatures up and snabbed him and took him down? Down, down, down. Can you imagine the pressure on your ears inside of that fish? I mean, even with the air bladder inside, it's still going to crush down and down. And you're down in there and weeds are engulfed around your head and you're crying out, oh Lord, I'm in the depths. I'm, I've got bars around me, he said. Forever, I'm trapped. How'd you like a three-day ride inside of that fish? Three days and three nights, he rides in this thing, and he cries out, oh, God, what, is there any lights inside, you think? You talk about freaky. You, can you imagine being in the belly of a fish and something bumps you in the dark, and it's slimy? And you're slowly being digested by fish acid. So, you know, you, 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 those of you that like to dye your hair, don't worry. After three days, I'm sure you go bleach white. You know, oil hairs on your head, your arms, everything just bleached out from the acid of the fish. Let alone maybe a little exfoliation going on probably, you know, that just eating away at the skin. And he's got weeds wrapped around his head. And he cries out and he says, the only thing I can offer to you, Lord, is that which I could give to you, a voice, a, a sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. In this deep, dark place, he's like, Lord, all I can do is 
There's nothing really he could give. He couldn't build an altar and offer something to God. He's in the belly of a fish. We sing a song. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Right? That's from the Psalms. We bring a sacrifice of praise. You know, it's sometimes it's hard to sacrifice from our own lips praise to God when we're in a bad way. Like Aaron was talking about last week. We don't do that well. Oh, Lord, thank you for this trial. This sucks. Oops. Am I allowed to say that? You know, you... you, you I know you're doing something. He was doing something all right. He was turning him around because he's going the wrong way. And after he gives the prayer, look at verse 10. What does it say? And then the Lord commanded the fish... And it vomited Jonah up onto the land. I like the Hebrew word here. It's literally like we would say projectile vomit. It's like a, it's um, poo, spew. Like literally blew him out up onto the beach. Can you imagine? He hits the beach like weeds and stuff wrapped around him. And he smells like fish guts. And he hits the beach and he's like, ah, Land! And he knows what he's supposed to do. Go to Nineveh. And he heads towards the great city. And we read this in the next chapter that Jonah arose in verse 3 and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Good, finally, Jonah, you're going the right way. But when he gets to Jonah, it says, uh, or to Nineveh, it says, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. It was three days' walk just to walk across the city. That's how big the city of Nineveh was. Three days of walking to cross the city. And he was so friendly in preaching his message, wasn't he? Seeker sensitive, truly a minister after our cultural heart. He goes, you don't think so? Listen to this. He cries out. Yet in 40 days, he says, Nineveh will be overthrown. It's doomed. Doomed, despair, agony on you guys. You're going to get it. Judgment's coming. Nice guy. Three day marching across the city. You're all going to burn. Such a sweetheart. But you know what's interesting? The people of Nineveh, if you read this chapter, they heard the message and they said, Oh no, we better change our ways. We better repent. They put on sackcloth and ashes and they asked God to have, have compassion on them. And verse 10 tells us when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked ways, God relented concerning the calamity that he declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And verse 4 says, And Jonah was greatly displeased. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 1. But he was greatly displeased, and he became angry. Jonah's ticked. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, and you're slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, so full of mercy, and you're one who relents concerning calamity. You won't even bring on judgment when they repent. Man, you're too nice. Such a nice prophet Jonah was, wasn't he? Everybody knows about this prophet Jonah. They don't know he wasn't so nice. He actually didn't want to preach to these people. Because why? Why didn't he want to preach to them? Because he knew that God was so compassionate and if they would repent, that God would bring judgment. And he wanted them to get judged. He's like, those filthy Ninevites, I want them to get it. God, zap them. Have you ever met Christians like that? I hate to say they exist. They're even sometimes in our ranks. I hate it. They're like so full of judgment. They just want everyone to get it. But they're missing the bigger picture. God is compassionate, full of mercy, slow to anger, one who relents concerning calamity. He will turn away the calamity if the person will just repent. Now, isn't that a good gospel message? This whole thing, this Jonah analogy is very important because it's saying God will relent the calamity that's due if the people will repent. And what was John the Baptist's very first message when he's pointing out the Lamb of God? Very first word out of his mouth, what was it? Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Make straight the way of the Lord. Turn from your crookedness, your wicked ways. Get on the right path. Here comes the Lord. Make ready the way of the Lord. Here he comes. God wants us to hear this message to repent of our sin so we don't have to have calamity. Jonah, he's all cranky about it. I knew they were going to repent, and then I knew you were going to be nice. You are going to forgive him. You're such a softy God. He's bad. You know what's interesting? I don't, how many of you know the rest of this chapter? It, it, Jonah is such a short book. But it's really cute. The, I, I think it's amazing. The Lord, Jonah is ticked. He, he's like, I knew you were going to be nice to them. Therefore, O oh Lord, verse 3. How many of you knew this? Jonah's a real fatalist. Lord, then take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. I'm so mad about this, you just kill me. Man, he really didn't like the Ninevites. Just kill me, man. And the Lord said to him, Do you have a good reason to be angry? And Jonah went out from the city, and he, 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 he sat east of it. And therefore, it says, he made a shelter for himself, and he sat under it in, in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So he goes and builds a little shelter and sitting there staring at the city. East of it. Can you imagine? And the Lord God appointed a plant, and he grew it up over Jonah to be shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. How many of you heard about the plant in the story of Jonah? I'm amazed because a lot of Christians don't know this part of the story. They know the part of the fish. They don't know about the plant. But what happens with the plant? God makes the plant come up, gives Jonah shade over his head. I don't know if Jonah was bald by now. Maybe his hair was all eaten off. So he's getting a little sunburned dome up there. and He's having a hard day. But the, the plant comes up and shades him, and he's really happy about it. But verse 7 says that God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and the worm attacked the plant, and it withered the plant. And when the sun came up, God appointed scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint, and he begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. How many of you heard that Jonah actually did this twice? It would be better to die than to live. Has anyone ever felt like that, by the way? You're having a rough week, you think it would just be better to be dead. I am not a fatal, I am a really positive person, but when I had that, that flu cold thing, I felt like someone put an ax into my forehead right here, down deep into my sinuses, behind my eyeballs, and it just felt like I couldn't get the ax out, like someone had chopped it right into there. And I, I told Jan, I said, I have never felt a headache hurt this bad. Like I literally think dying would be better than the pain I'm feeling like right now in my head. It just feels like I can't stop the pain. And I'm ne I told her, I never feel like this. I never, st I never even think like this. But when, when you're in deep pain, and in this case, he's not in pain because he's got a headache. Well, maybe he does, the heat and the wind and the scorching sun. And but he's like, God, death would be better to me than life. And God said to Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, yeah, I have a good reason to be angry, even to death. I'm so mad about that poor plant being gone. I, I just want to die. Now, how many of you remember this in Sunday school? They taught this. Because I never heard this part in Sunday school. I heard about the fish. I heard about him throwing Jonah up onto the beach. I heard about Jonah doing the preaching thing. I never heard about the plant. And I never heard about Jonah wanting to die over the plant. But the Lord then spoke to him something really interesting. This is a real capper, by the way. Look at verse 10. Then the Lord said to him, You had compassion on the plant, for which you did not work, and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left? as well as the many animals. You had a compassion on a plant that grew up and was only on the earth for one day. But you don't have compassion on 120,000 people and all their animals. Can you see a flaw here with the prophet Jonah? Kind of like 
you know, what, what is he, a tree hugger? He likes the nature better than the people. I hate to say this is actually a reality. There are people that care more about nature and plants than they care about their fellow human beings. They have no compassion for other people on this planet. Get rid of them. They're using up our dwindling resources. That's, by the way, such hogwash. That's a lie of the devil. You know that each one of us has the propensity to, in our lifetime, to make more things than we can consume. It's just the way God wired us. We have the ability, farmers can grow more food than they can eat. Guys that build in construction can build more houses than they can live in. It's, a, it's just a, it's a given gift from God, innately put into each person, that we have abilities. And if we just use those abilities, whatever the giftings God has given us, we can use them to such an extent that we have a surplus. So when you get more people, guess what? You get more surplus. But the devil lies and says, oh no, you have competing for resources. Baloney! We have so much extra stuff, we just have corruption. We have corruption by a few elitists that are controlling the purse strings on so much. If we could just take that money and put it to where it would be useful, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these problems. But see, the Bible prophesied that in the last days the love of many will wax what? Cold. People's hearts will be cold towards other people. They'll become Jonas. Bunch of Jonas running around. Stupid other people. I like the plant better. I'm mad about the plant. Kill me over the plant. The guy's good. There's 120,000 people in that city. Plus all their animals. Come on, even God throws in the animal card. I mean, maybe you wouldn't do it for the people, but what about the puppies? What about the little kitty cats, huh? I mean, isn't it amazing? There are people that love the animals more than they love people. It's true. But the Lord throws on Jonah, you don't even, as a prophet, don't have enough. you got more compassion over a plant that gave you shade than you do over all those people and all their, all their, all their pets. All their animals that give them sustenance. You, what kind of prophet is he? Well, he's the prophet that Jesus said would be the sign to the scribes and the Pharisees. That's the only sign they get. That as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth. Now this is interesting. He says, he's going to be three days and three nights in the, what's he going to do for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? I cheated. I found a verse in the New Testament that actually tells me what it, what went on. It's actually from the Old Testament, but you know, sometimes you don't know, like I said, the best commentary on the Old Testament is the New Testament. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. So I can show you the answer to that. When Christ died and was laid in the tomb, he wasn't just laying around dead. There was a scripture that was spoken of him in Psalm 68. You can look from verses 8 to 10. 10 especially being the one uh, of great interest. But it says in verse uh, Ephesians 4, 7, I'm sorry, 4, 8, it says, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high... He led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to all men. Now, verse 9 says this expression, that he ascended. What does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. And he who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all heavens, so that he might fill all things. Before he descended, uh, or ascended into heaven, he first descended into the heart of the earth. Why? What's down in the heart of the earth? There was a place called Abraham's bosom. And, a, and a, a, that was the AC compartment. And there was another part called Hades. Where, where we're told that there was a man who died. A rich man. And he found himself there. In Luke chapter 16, if you want to know where that is. It's a very important part of this. That Jesus went, well, I know this because, well, Jesus actually gave it away. I can't help it. No, I, I, I didn't come up with this one on my own. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. When Jesus was with his disciples, he went to his own hometown there in Nazareth, and they brought him up the, the scripture to read as was the, was the custom there in the synagogue in verse 16 of Luke 4. 
And so he stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus. And he opened the book, and he found the passage. It's um, in our Bible, it's Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those that are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now this was a prophetic scripture, Isaiah 61. They, if you, well, we sing the very next verse after this is, Put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness, right? Lift up your voice to who? To God. Praise with the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. This is the verse right before that, that song that we sing all the time. Putting on a garment of praise when your spirit is heavy. Why? Because what was announced right before this verse? That the Messiah was going to come and proclaim release to the captives. Get all those captives released. And he's going to and he's going to bring the gospel to the poor and recovery of sight to the blind, set free those that are oppressed and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is the favorable year. What year is it? The year the Messiah is going to come and die for our sins and be buried. And how many days later? Three days later, he's going to rise. All according to, is this a favorable year of the Lord? This is the favorable year that the Jews have been waiting for. The year that the Messiah would come. See, they knew it was coming. It's like us knowing that the Lord promised he would come again. We know it's coming. We don't know the exact day or hour. No, no man, it says, knows except the Father. But when that day comes, will that, have, will that be the favorable year of the Lord for his second coming? Oh, yeah. Can't wait for that one. But see, back then, they didn't know in his first coming, they were like, well, we know it's promised the Messiah is going to come. We know he's going to suffer. We know he's going to die. Um, I think he's going to get buried. Yeah, yeah. And um, the three days later rise thing, they didn't quite get it. But if you want to study that Genesis 22 story just one more time, how many days did the father see his son as they walked? How many days walk did they take after they said, you servants wait here. I and the lad will go yonder and worship. How many days did they walk before they came to the mount that they built the altar on? Three days. In the mind of the father, Abraham, his son Isaac is what? Dead. It will not be until he lifts that knife to plunge it into his son that the Lord will say, stop, use the ram. And Abraham gets to a type of, the, of God and the resurrection of his son, Abraham gets his son back from the altar as a type of Jesus coming back from the dead. But in his mind, he's been dead as they walked for three days and he carried that wood and he carried the fire and he had the knife. Think about it. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. God is testing you. Go take your son, your only son, to the mount I show you. And he takes him to the very mount of Moriah the very mountain range that the hillside today of Golgotha, or we say Calvary in Latin, that the place of the skull, the very hill that Jesus was crucified on. By the way, I, I'm going to ask him to roll tape. I, I wonder how close the spot was that Abraham put the altar to the spot where Jesus would later be crucified. I, I, I won't be surprised at all if they're like identical. It went, no shocker. Not when you're talking God and his pure sovereignty. Go to the spot I show you. And, you'll be, and, and you go offer your son. And so here we have the scripture fulfilled. That God did, according to the scripture, give his son to die for our sins. And he gave his son to be buried. And he gave his son to rise again three days later. All according to the scripture. Now could you tell your friend the story don't use the New Testament. Could you take them to the psalm where it says, in what was Psalm 16, he says um, that he shall not allow 
thy holy one to undergo decay, nor will I abandon my soul, your soul to Sheol. Verse 10 of Psalm 16. You need to know that one. The Messiah was not going to get to stay in the grave. It was prophesied already in the Psalms. It was prophesied in the Psalm 22 that he would suffer and, and the whole crucifixion scene. And in Isaiah 52 and 53 that he would be crucified for our sins. But then you can tell him the Jonah story. That he would, that he would just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the... And if they're a real skeptic, real cynic, say, hey, you remind me of one of the scribes. The Pharisees, back in Jesus' day, he said the only sign they get is the sign of Jonah. I might as well tell you the sign of Jonah. Because Jonah prophesied, not a really sweet message, but a message that was the right message. Repent, or you're going to get judged. Now, people don't want me to tell them that's part of the message today. Is that part of the message today? Should I tell people you need to repent from your sin? People tell me, don't say that, Pastor. You're going to lose people. There's a lot of churches. They left that whole message out now. It's, it's not really seeker-sensitive. It's not really user-friendly. You know, you need to say, I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Let's all be okay together. No, we're not okay. We got stinking sin, and we need to repent of it. And if we don't repent of it and get ready for the coming of the Lord then guess what? The coming of the Lord is going to overtake us like a thief in the night, Jesus said. It's going to be a surprise. We're going to be like, shock! Oh no, Lord, you're back. I didn't expect you. But see, I don't want to be one of those ones that's shocked. When he comes, I want to be one of the ones going, I tell you guys, and I, by the way, this would be really good timing. Lord, is there any clouds? Yep, there's clouds right there. It says his coming's in the clouds. So he could come right now, right when I'm telling you that he could come again. And then for the rest of eternity, I'm going to tell you, I told you, didn't I tell you? I told you so. Listen, if I could ever be right on one thing, that would be the thing I'd want to be right on. I mean, not because I win extra points, because I get you to think, get ready for his coming. Because we don't know when it is. It could be any minute. And I wouldn't mind if it was before we put away all this stuff. Can you imagine... <laughs> the next group that shows up here for Memorial Day weekend, all these chairs and tents are here, and we're all gone poof. We've been caught up to be with the Lord. And they're going, what was this stuff here for? Who's this belong to? We'd be all gone. It wouldn't matter. They, they watch the playback on the little cameras. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Because the guys that get left behind, that, that's a great tribulation coming. That's not going to be good. Get ready for the coming of the Lord. And we don't know when it is. So we should always keep our heart ready. We should be ready. You know, that story of Luke 16 where Jesus said that rich man that lived in, in splendor and gay living, he had all, of the, all his needs met and he, he had a guy, a, a poor man named Lazarus, begging at his gate, just begging for the crumbs that would fall from the rich man's table. I said, and besides that, even the dogs were licking his sores. And they both died. You guys know this, Luke 16, right? And the rich man, it says, in torment, he lifted up his eyes from Hades towards Abraham's bosom, and he said to Abraham, send down that guy Lazarus with, a, with what? With what? One drop of water. I am in agony from this flame. I'm going to end with this verse. Look at the last verse of Luke 16. I know I went all over the place today, but... For Cindy, our dear note taker, when she's watching, she can watch this on YouTube. And you, that's the advantage. If you miss something, you can rewind. Just drag the little thing back and, and watch it again. But he begged for one drop of water. Now, he still had a rich man's mentality. I'm not going to ask Abraham to come bring me some water. Send me that, that poor beggar, Lazarus to give me a drop of water on my tongue, for I am in agony from these flames. And Abraham answered him and said, Listen, can't, no can do. There's a great chasm fixed between here and there. Even if we wanted to cross over, can't do. And you, you know, remember that in your life you had your good things. And he infers that Lazarus, he didn't have the good things, but now he was being comforted. Which, by the way, this answers a great question. Will we, will we remember this life after we die? According to Jesus. 
Look at verse. Look at Luke 16. The answer is right there. Abraham said it. Remember that in your life you had. You will remember this life. Will you remember your family? Who's right ahead in this chapter? What's the next request of the rich man? Well, if you can't send him to me to give me some water to drink, send him back from the dead to, because I have five brothers. And tell my brothers, look at this, verse 28, I have five brothers. Send him that he might warn them so that they might not come to this place of torment. He can even remember his family. And he is now has his eyes open to how much torment he's in. He's like, please send him and tell him to get it right because they, I don't want them to come to this place of torment. You know when people say, oh, it's going to be a big party in hell. It doesn't matter. We're just going to be having fun together, just partying hardy. What a lie of the devil. When you're in torment, if it was so fun, he would have said, yeah, just uh, don't even bother. I can't wait till my brothers get here. We'll have a big party. No, he said, send Send Lazarus to warn him. And Abraham, verse 29 of Luke 16 said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And listen to the words of Abraham right here. But he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and, and the prophets, then they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. You know, you can, if someone won't listen to the Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures that proclaim the promise of the Messiah, and you say, but Jesus is risen from the dead, they go, so? If they won't hear Moses and the prophets, Jesus hit it right on the head. He said, then Abraham told him, neither will they be persuaded even if someone rises from the, it won't do it. See, faith doesn't come from him rising from the dead. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? By the Word of God. It's the Word of God we need to hear that, that causes us to grow in faith. And it's that Word of faith that pointing us to the, to the Lamb that takes away our sins that we need to hear that message over and over. And some of you guys, you know, you know this. This is the bones of the gospel. You're like, oh, I know this. You know, Jesus came, he was the lamb, that was promised. He was the one, the, the God with us, Jehovah Jireh, God provided himself a lamb. That was the provision right there. He's the one that takes away the sins of the world. Well, guys, he died for our sins and he was buried. And three days later, according to the scripture, he rose. But what did he do when he descended in Ephesians 4? He proclaimed release to the captives. Who wants to get out of here? And now Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, that in, or sorry, 2 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6, he says that, that when you die as a believer now, you're absent from the body and you're not present in Abraham's bosom. Where are you present? With the Lord. Abraham's bosom was like the waiting room. I tell the kids it's like the dentist's office. You know how you have to wait in the waiting room before they call you to go in? Until they open the door, you can't go in. And until Jesus came and was the door that opened to get back to the Father, that doorway, all those guys in Abraham's bosoms were, were trapped in the waiting room. The, the door wasn't open yet. So if you were ever taught like I was that when you die, you had to go to this place and wait. In Catholic school, they told us purgatory. They got the idea of purgatory from the story of Abraham and, and, and Lazarus and the rich man. But they got it wrong. Because the room's empty now. Abraham's bosom is not like vacant. No, no need to go stay there. You're absent from the body, where do you go? You get to go straight to be with the Lord. That's what Jesus did. He made the way to get us back to the Father. But all those people before Jesus, they had to wait till the door was open to get in. And Christ was the only one to open that door. And so this is the gospel. This is the good news. Jesus came and made the way. Now when we put our faith in him and we die, Jesus says, even if you die, you don't really die. You just move. I look forward to the day of my moving. Anyone else here? Without being a fatalist or a Jonah, oh, I wish I was dead. 
No, no, I don't wish I was dead. I can't wait to the day when I get to live in heaven. I mean, the streets are made out of pure gold. You think, man, our, our most valuable stuff down here, we're like, he's like, I use that for asphalt. You know? Heavenly asphalt. We got it made. We have such, such a great, my daughter Joy's like, I can't wait to go to heaven. She has a great attitude about it. Like, because like, she knows how, she probably heard me talk about it a little bit. You know, Christians don't talk about how great it's going to be, so no wonder people are afraid about going there. If you really study the scriptures, you'll find that heaven's awesome. My son's already going, Dad, when we get there, I'm going to have this floating island. But when I say floating, I mean up in, the, in space, like suspended. Like, like um, I don't know, we were watching this one thing where the guy gets into this thing and he, Avatar, he controls this thing. They had these suspended islands with waterfalls coming down, really cool animation in it. He goes, mine's going to be better than that in heaven. And I'm going to be able to just fly or, or just think. Here I am and I'm thinking about someone way over there on a different continent. Poof. Jumper. You know, like from a different movie. Poof. I mean, who, who says we can't do that in heaven? Would that, anyone here up for like, you know, you're here and you're like, but I want to go see my auntie and she's over in Chicago. And you just think it and poof. You're. Do you think we'll be able to do that, by the way? I mean, Jesus was with his disciples. He broke bread. He blessed it. And what happened? He was gone. He reappears. I don't think the rules what we're used to are going to apply. I'm just, uh, I'm just admitting as a possibility, we might be able to move a little faster. Maybe through different dimensions than we're used to thinking. And I think it's because we just don't look at the scripture with, with the eyes of, this, of faith. How great is our God that has accomplished this for us, that he would become flesh for us and die for us and be buried for us and rise for us so that there is no more stinger in death. Oh, death, O oh death, where is thy sting? Christ has overcome it. We don't have nothing to worry about. But you know, if you think someone res res resurrected from the dead is going to persuade someone, I got news for you. Wrong. It's the message of Moses and the prophets. It's the promise God made that gives us faith. Tell them the promise. That's why Paul said of first importance, the bones of first importance is these three things according to the scripture. Let's learn the scripture. You might have to tell a Jewish buddy about this. It'd be good if you could tell them from their scripture. So, I gave you a lot to think about. I'm sorry, but this is like one of my favorite parts of this is really the gospel boiled down to its most fundamental things. And yet, you could do this all from the Old Testament. You don't need the New Testament to do it. You could just use the verses we went over. And there's many more, too. I, 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 it was very hard to pick just these ones. But if you want extra credit, come out to you know, midweek service and ask me, and I'll throw in a few extras so you can have fun with your Jewish friends. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that gives us this great, reiteration of your promise, Lord. It just continually tells us of what you have done for us in your Son. And thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying for us. Thank you for your love. Lord, we just pray that we would be able to share that love with all those around us. Lord, for the ones that are hurting, again, we pray for our brothers and sisters on the, on the south part of our island that are suffering the loss of all that they have. Lord, the, the lava swallowing up their homes, their community. Lord, I just pray that you would be with our sister, Auntie Jen, over there, that you would watch over her. and Lord, just, we just come to you. We, we say, Lord, help our islands. We need your hand and your help. Help us, Lord. Thank you for the, the blowing of that nice breeze off the ocean. Please continue to blow it, to blow the fog away. We ask it. I ask it anyway. Anyone agree with me? In Jesus' name, amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.